Hello, my name is Jan Storre. I'm a senior consultant of a lung hospital in Cologne, Germany. And I would like to give you an overview of different techniques to monitor the gas exchange in patients who are on mechanical ventilation. I would like to give you a short overview of the topics. First of all, I would like to show the pathophysiology of the respiratory system, followed by the principles of gas exchange monitoring and possibilities to monitor a patient non-invasively, and then conclude showing some case reports and the conclusion of gas exchange monitoring during mechanical ventilation. If you take a look at the pathophysiology of the respiratory system, you have to be aware that there are two compartments. First of all, we have the lung. If the patient suffers from lung disease, such as lung edema or interstitial lung diseases, there is a problem of oxygen uptake into the blood. You will see a drop in partial pressure of oxygen, and if the patient is capable to hyperventilate, you might see a drop in carbon dioxide. We call this respiratory failure type 1 or hypoxemic respiratory failure. On the other hand, if the respiratory pump is affected, the patient is not able to transfer enough gas from the atmosphere into the alveola. Here you will find a drop in partial pressure of oxygen and an increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood. We call this hypercapnic respiratory failure or respiratory failure type 2. The different compartments are very important for the treatment. Once the patient suffers from hypoxemic respiratory failure or respiratory failure type 1, the patient needs a supply of oxygen or a continuous positive airway pressure. On the other hand, if the patient suffers from ventilatory failure and the respiratory pump is affected, the patients need help for ventilation and this is done by mechanical ventilation. To get an idea of the diagnostic, it's very important to know normal or standard values from the arterial blood gas. The pH is normally around 7.40 and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is around 40 millimeters of mercury. Regarding the oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen is above 70 millimeters of mercury depending on the age of the patient. And the saturation of oxygen in the blood should be above 95%. The monitoring of gas exchange can be done in different ways. The most important thing to know is that the arterial blood gas analysis is a gold standard and the most reliable technique. On the other hand, there's a big wish to have easier procedures and to monitor patients non-invasively. Here you have different options like monitor the end tidal carbon dioxide pressure or transcutaneous pressure of carbon dioxide or, which is very familiar, just the oxygen saturation. The key diagnostic tool in respiratory failure type 1 or hypoxemic respiratory failure is a partial pressure of oxygen in the blood or the oxygen saturation. These values can be monitored by an arterial blood gas analysis or the oxygen saturation. Regarding the ventilatory failure, we need to monitor the pH and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Again, this could be done by the arterial blood gas analysis. On the other hand, we have the possibility to monitor end tidal pressure of carbon dioxide or transcutaneous pressure of carbon dioxide. 
I would like to display in more detail the advantages and disadvantages of the different techniques to monitor gas exchange. First of all, I would like to take a look to the gold standard arterial blood gas analysis. Of course, it is the most reliable results you can get. And the big advantage is, if you need further information, you will get the pH, the partial pressure of oxygen, together with the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, and, for example, further information like electrolytes, bicarbonate, or the base excess. However, it has some disadvantages. First of all, it's an invasive and painful procedure, and if you need frequent values or frequent analysis, you need maybe an arterial line, which is often implemented in the acute setting in the ICU. That it only provides a snapshot of the ventilatory status. And in the chronic setting, during sleep, for example, it would be sleep disturbing. So there's a big wish to have continuous and non-invasive techniques to monitor the ventilation. If you take a look at other options to monitor carbon dioxide, for example in ventilatory failure, you have the option to monitor end tidal partial pressure of carbon dioxide. The big advantage of this technique is it is continuous and non-invasively, it provides immediately stable values, and of course it's not sleep disturbing once you monitor the patient overnight. However, there is a disadvantage because, especially in lung disease, if there are vent ventilation perfusion mismatches, this technique is not validated so far. Another disadvantage is that during, for example, non-invasive ventilation, there are many leaks around the mask, for example. Another option to monitor carbon dioxide is the use of transcutaneous pressure of carbon dioxide. Here, again, we have the advantage to, put, to have a continuous and non-invasive tool. In line to the previous technique, it shouldn't be sleep disturbing. The disadvantages of transcutaneous CO2 monitoring is in case of vasoconstriction or skin edema. Another disadvantage is that the setup need around five minutes and the person who perform the measurement has to be trained very well. Once before you get reliable values, the monitor needs 10 to 15 minutes. And another disadvantage of this technique is that the technical drift occurs over time. It would be ideal to combine different kinds of non-invasive monitoring to measuring gas exchange. That would be most convenient for the patient and you have the chance to get a continuous monitoring and a safe monitoring of the patient. For example, the monitoring of end tidal pressure of carbon dioxide together with pulse oximetry representing the oxygen saturation would be a very good solution. On the other hand, you have the option to combine transcutaneous measurements of carbon dioxide together with a pulse oximetry and oxygen, oxygen saturation. I would look, like to show you a patient who is on invasive ventilation via tracheostomy and we monitored these patients by different techniques over a period of 60 minutes. In the filled circles you see the transcutaneous CO2, in the open circles representing the end tidal monitoring of carbon dioxide and the triangles representing the arterial blood gas analysis. As you can see in this example, 
the patient is stably ventilated and the trends of both non-invasive and continuous techniques follow each other quite nicely. Here in this patient suffering from lung emphysema, the transcutaneous CO2 values reflecting the arterial pressure of carbon dioxide more accurate than end tidal CO2. However, the trend over time is similar. I provide a second example where patient again is tracheostomized and on invasive mechanical ventilation. However, this patient suffers only from respiratory pump failure here by restrictive disorder. Again, we monitored this patient over a period of 60 minutes with transcutaneous CO2, end tidal CO2 and three times with a, represented by the triangles by the arterial blood gas analysis. As you can see in the graph, there is a very good correlation between the both non-invasive techniques to monitor the carbon dioxide. Both lines follow each other over the 60 minutes and there is nearly no differences to the gold standard arterial blood gas analysis. And this is mostly due to the healthy lung and the homogeneous air which coming out of the lung. So, I would like to conclude. First of all, the respiratory system is very complex and it's necessary to understand the transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Secondly, the most important tools to monitor patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure is a partial pressure of oxygen and the oxygen saturation. Thirdly, if the patient is suffering from respiratory pump failure or ventilatory failure, which is often the cause in mechanical ventilation, you have to monitor the pH and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Next, you have to know that arterial blood gas analysis is a gold standard technique to monitor the gas exchange and it shows the most reliable values. Finally, it would be ideal to provide a continuous and non-invasive monitoring for gas exchange especially in ventilatory failure for carbon dioxide. This could be done using end tidal pressure of carbon dioxide or transcutaneous pressure of carbon dioxide. As I am convinced that the knowledge about the different options of gas exchange monitoring are very important in the field of mechanical ventilation and will help you improving your treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.